There is a ton of misinformation out there when it comes to the hottest battery chemistry in the electric car world. Lithium iron phosphate, or LFP. The F is silent. While the electric car market is currently dominated by nickel manganese cobalt, or NMC batteries, it's expected that LFP will surpass NMC by the year 2028, a not too distant future. From a consumer standpoint, one of the most common questions is understandably, what are the best practices for ensuring my electric car's battery lasts as long as possible? The answer to this question changes depending on the chemistry of your battery. Now, I already have a video explaining best practices for NMC chemistries, which is absolutely worth checking out. In this video, we're going to be focusing on LFP batteries, and boy oh boy is there a ton of conflicting information out there. With that said, a brand new study does a great job of explaining how and why these batteries lose capacity over time, which leads to logical best practices. And you may be surprised by these considering what car manufacturers are saying you should be doing. So let's start with their saying you should do. Take, for example, Ford's electric crossover, the Mustang Mach-E. And first off, a huge props to Ford here because they make it a completely painless process to understand what battery chemistry the vehicle has. Quoting the owner's manual, if the eighth VIN digit is a four or five, you have a lithium iron phosphate LFP battery. And if there is any other digit or letter, you have the nickel cobalt manganese NCM style battery. Every single electric car maker should be making it this it's easy to understand what chemistry your battery is. Now, Ford's chemistry strategy isn't uncommon. Tesla's is very similar, where you'll find LFP batteries in standard or lower range vehicles and NMC batteries in extended or higher range vehicles. But again, the only way you'll really know without disassembling the battery is to be told by the car maker. So once you know it's LFP, what does Ford say you should do? Quote, Set the maximum charge level to 100% and charge to 100% at least once per month to maintain range accuracy. Now immediately you'll notice this is the exact opposite of what you should do for NMC batteries, where for daily use you want to set that to a lower charge limit, say 70%. Okay, what else does Ford say to do with the LFP battery? Quote, during regular use, you can increase the battery life by maintaining the state of charge at 100%. When storing for an extended time, that the battery state of charge be approximately 50%. Now, grammatically, that last sentence is a disaster, but to be fair to Ford, also I, not often words correct, also. But what are they even saying? First, you can increase the battery life by keeping it at 100%. Second, if you're storing it for a long time, keep the battery at 50%. These are obviously conflicting statements, but there's a good reason for it. And so in order to understand this, we need to look at the voltage curves for both NMC and LFP batteries. Okay, so here we're looking at state of charge versus voltage. So we have the state of charge of the battery ranging from 0% to 100%, and we have the voltage at the cell level ranging from 2.5 to about 4.5 volts here, just for our diagram. And we're looking at LFP in red and NMC chemistry in blue. Now you'll notice two distinct differences. First of all, NMC tends to operate at a significantly higher voltage. But second of all, and more importantly here for the discussion of this video, LFP has a much flatter voltage curve versus NMC where it has a steeper slope. So let's say you want to tell the driver of an electric car how much battery percentage is remaining. Well, let's say your battery's chemistry is NMC and the cell level voltage is reading at 3.7 volts. So you come across at 3.7, you come down and boom, what do you know? Your battery is at 50% charge remaining. Well, let's do the same for LFP. Now let's say you have a voltage readout of 3.3 volts. Well, it could be 75% or it could be 95% because it's a very flat section of that voltage curve for the LFP chemistry. So you don't really know what is that battery percentage. So you have to use a different methodology. So what do they do? Well, you essentially look at current going in and current going out of that battery. And you start to calculate essentially how many electrons have gone out, how many electrons have come back in, where are we at with the charge percentage? 
As you do this over time, that readout starts to become less and less accurate. And of course, the driver needs to know an accurate estimation of how much battery percentage they have left. So how do you correct that calculation once it starts to get off? Well, as you can see, if you charge up to 100%, you start to have this voltage spike. And so you can immediately identify, okay, boom, we're back at 100%. And you can know for a fact, all right, we're at 100%, I can reset the calculation for determining how much battery percentage we have left. Okay, so now we understand why Ford says you should charge to 100%, because otherwise it's difficult to know your battery's exact state of charge, or remaining percentage. So this leads to best practice number one, charge to 100% at least once per month. This isn't purely about battery longevity, but more so that your vehicle accurately displays the charge percentage, which is an obviously critical metric to know when driving around. So then why do they say if you're storing the car for longer periods of time to leave the battery at 50%? Well, generally speaking, which is a dangerous thing to say with battery chemistries, battery longevity is negatively associated with both temperature and voltage. That is to say, you'll have more battery degradation when you're operating the battery at high temperatures and when it's operating at a higher state of charge, because a higher state of charge correlates with a higher voltage. By storing the battery at 50%, you're storing it at a lower voltage. So this means you'll have less degradation over time. Okay, so we've got best practice number two. When storing your car for extended periods of time, store it at a lower state of charge. As an example, Ford recommends 50%. Now at this point, you'll realize why it's difficult for Ford to recommend best practices in the owner's manual. On one hand, you need to charge up to 100% in order for the battery to be properly calibrated. On the other hand, charging to 100% frequently results in more battery degradation. It's basically a lose-lose scenario because you can't satisfy both conditions. So what is the best practice? Well, there's an ideal answer and then there's a realistic answer. To explain this, we'll look at a study that I referenced at the beginning of this video, conducted in Jeff Don's lab, who has been described as Tesla's secret weapon. It's not a secret. Don's lab has received grants from Tesla for research, and he is a co-creator of the patent for NMC in the year 2000, which again is currently the most popular battery chemistry on the market for electric cars. Simply put, the dude knows batteries. So what does the latest study out of his lab say? The first sentence of the conclusion, quote, cycling near the top of charge, 75 to 100% state of charge, is detrimental to LFP graphite cells, end quote. It goes on to state, quote, time spent cycling at high states of charge is critical to minimize. Yikes! Okay, so there's a lot of context that's very important here. In an ideal world where the only thing you care about is battery longevity, the third best practice is simple. Operate at lower state of charge ranges when possible. This comes directly from the study in which they state, we would recommend that LFP cells for long lifetime applications operate at low states of charge on average with charging up to 100% only on occasion. Now, it's important to state that this recommendation is based on the results of this study. So what did they do and how did they reach this conclusion? The goal was to see how the operating window of the battery impacted longevity. So they looked at five different state of charge ranges, zero to 25%, zero to 60%, zero to 80%, 0 to 100% and 75 to 100%. For each of these ranges, the batteries underwent 2,500 hours of cycling. Okay, so all of the different ranges tested had the same amount of total energy going through them. So if you did 0 to 25%, okay, well if you do that four times, that's the same as going 0 to 100% one time. So regardless of which battery range you're looking at, 0 to 60, 0 to 100, 75 to 100, any of them, they all have the same amount of total capacity going through the batteries. It'd be the equivalent of driving your car on four short trips and charging after each trip, or one really long trip and only charging once. Both scenarios take the same amount of time and energy, but they use different range percentages of your car's battery. Now, in addition to these five different state of charge ranges, they also tested three other variables, temperature, 
the electrolyte used, and the graphite used for the negative electrode. Of all of these variables, the most significant variable in this study was the state of charge window that the cells operated in. The simplistic overview is that the lower the operating window of state of charge range, the better. So operating an LFP battery from 0 to 25% had the least degradation, followed by operating 0 to 60%, which was better than 0 to 100%, which was better than 75 to 100%. Okay, so why? Well, there's two parts to this. First, the battery state of charge, and second, the act of cycling, or charging and discharging. Okay, chemistry is complicated, so if you want the most detailed explanation, I'm going to write out below basically a longer version of what's happening within the chemistry of this battery and what's causing it to reduce in capacity over time. The short story is the biggest failure mode for lithium iron phosphate batteries is a reduction of lithium inventory. In other words, that lithium that you have going back and forth in your battery between the positive and the negative, you're reducing that lithium inventory. So if you reduce the total amount of lithium you can shift from one side of the battery to the other, well that means you have less total capacity. Less capacity, your battery is not as useful as it once was. So part of why this occurs, if you're at a higher state of charge, you're at a higher voltage, so these negative reactions that are occurring within your electrolyte are accelerated that are consuming that lithium inventory. Now this is true regardless of the battery type. So if it is LFP or if it is NMC, but it has a graphite electrode for the negative side, well then it's going to have this occur. Okay, but what about the cycling part of the equation, going from 75% to 100%? Okay, so specific to lithium iron phosphate batteries, and again, it doesn't really matter if you're at the higher end or the lower end, this is still going to occur, but when you're cycling that battery, you're going to end up taking iron from the positive electrode, dissolving it, and depositing it onto the negative electrode. And this consumes lithium inventory, which again, degrades the battery. So to summarize, by keeping the battery fully charged, you're keeping the battery in a state that creates harmful compounds. As you cycle the battery, these increased harmful compounds result in dissolving iron from the positive and depositing it onto the negative. Okay, this all sounds really scary, right? The thing is, the testing for this experiment was done at a constant 40 degrees C or at a constant 55 degrees C, significantly hotter than the average temperature of where most people live. You do the testing at higher temperatures because you can accelerate the degradation and learn faster. If you want to see if a battery can last for 20 years in normal conditions, well if your test uses normal conditions, it will take 20 years to complete. But with harsher testing, you can get a better idea in a much shorter period of time if a battery will last that long. And plenty of studies have shown that even in challenging conditions, a well-designed LFP battery can easily last the lifetime of the vehicle, whether that's 200,000 miles or longer. Regardless, as far as your individual LFP electric car, the third best practice remains. Operate at lower state of charge ranges when possible. But what an absolute pain to charge your electric car to say 50% most of the time and then occasionally to 100%. I think there's actually a very convenient solution here, which leads to best practice number four. Only plug in your car when you need to. This is 100% counter to what you should do with an NMC battery because small charge cycles are really important to an NMC battery. It's also 100% counter to what Tesla says in their owner's manuals. In all caps, bold, leave your vehicle plugged in. There's a good reason Tesla says this, which we'll get into, but let's go back to the LFP cycling study. Now again, this was at elevated temperatures and thus faster degradation, but the battery cycled from 0 to 100% had less degradation than the battery continuously cycled from 75 to 100%. Okay, and so you feel more confident about this, consider what Tesla says inside their LFP battery EVs. On the charging screen, they state, quote, we recommend keeping your charge limit at 100% and charging fully once per week. This is a very carefully worded sentence. You'll notice it basically tells the owner to avoid the exact scenario this paper says is worst for your battery. Small charge cycles at the top end of your battery. Charging fully once per week means letting it drain down. 
but also eventually charging to 100% so the computer knows what the battery's actual state of charge is. So this raises a really interesting point. If you don't have a place to charge your EV at home, you might be better off buying an LFP battery EV for two reasons. First, they need to somewhat regularly be charged to 100%. And if you want to minimize your trips to the charger, well, it's nice to go there, charge it up to 100% and bring it back. Second, because it's more beneficial to drain the battery further down rather than just operate it on that top end, that means, again, less visits to the charger. So this is beneficial for those who don't have a charger at home. If you can charge at home, which chemistry you pick is less important. If you go NMC, you can benefit from frequent small charges and keeping the battery's maximum charge limit at a lower level. And if you're going on a longer trip, well then you can charge it up to 100% when you need it. Now, I'd love to close the video there, but it's important to realize that the purpose of this video was to discuss the best practices for battery longevity alone. That is it. It is not to say what are the best practices overall, which I think the automakers do a better job of. Tesla says just leave it plugged in. That's just plain good advice, because if you come out to your garage and you go to your car and it hasn't been plugged in and your range is too low, rightfully, you're gonna be upset. If a storm hits your area and all local electricity is out and you've set your battery percentage to 25% for battery longevity, well, yeah, you're not gonna be that stoked when you're trying to get out of there and you don't have any charge. Also, you should never let your battery get down to 0%, period. It can cause permanent damage to the battery. Now, smart manufacturers will build in a little bit of a buffer to help prevent this from happening. But still, if you have just one cell out of all the cells in your battery pack that gets a little too low, it can cause big problems. So draining the battery pack really, really low is a very real risk you should avoid despite the best operating window in this study being from zero to 25%. Finally, generalizations about best practices when you have a huge variety of existing chemistries are difficult to make. I read a bunch of papers in compiling this video, but they may not match the conditions you live in or the chemistry of your car. For example, in the main study I've discussed in this video, they readily admitted that one study shows that cycling LFP graphite cells over a lower average state of charge leads to more capacity fade than a higher average state of charge, which is the opposite of our findings. Though in this other study, they were cycling the battery cells with much higher charging and discharging rates. Though still, that other study found that storage at high state of charge causes more capacity fade than at low state of charge. So chemistry is hard. Innovation takes time. Things are always changing. Nobody knows anything, except sometimes we do. If you enjoyed this video, there's two videos I really think are worth checking out. First, what are the best practices for battery longevity for an NMC battery, a very popular chemistry for today's EVs. And also, if you want to understand electric vehicles better, you really need to understand how lithium ion batteries work. So I have a dedicated video just explaining that, which is great for insight on lithium ion batteries. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.